So my name is Maximiliano, I'm the frog, right? You can call me Max, that's okay. So this is uh, breaking limits on mobile HTML5. Uh, first, and uh, really quickly, I'm a mobile web developer, right? I have been doing uh, web development since 1995, right? And mobile web development since 2001, something called WML, right? Um, I'm from Argentina. I will not make any joke about Messi, right? The new pope, right? Or, or the new queen of the Netherlands. Um, as Tim said, I am the author of Ramming the Mobile Web and also jQuery Mobile App and Running, both from O'Reilly Media. Um, this is a talk about code. So I will show you code. So it's a, some kind of a different talk. I will share with you some hacks. So if you don't like code, you can get out and come back in 50 minutes. Um, my challenge today is to show you 15 hacks that you can use on a mobile web or a mobile web app, and most of them are usually unknown. Um, and I'm pretty sure, and even I can guarantee that each of you will get at least three or four at, for home that you don't know today, right? So questions, yes, please. Remember, the, you have the hashtag there, mobqa. So first, why hacks, right? Hacks. Um, I mean, don't seem like a good idea as, 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 uh, at the beginning. So first, this is the uh, image that some of us have about mobile web, right? So it's uh, something relaxing uh, where, I mean, the one, the, let's say the, there is only one web, right? Standards, uh, everything happy, it's peace. But basically, the reality today is that the mobile web, right, it's a minefield. Right, you are trying to get uh, something explodes. You are walking there, and you see a lot of explosions around you. Right, so that's the reality. Um, this talk is about breaking limits. Right, so when we need to break some limits, unfortunately, right, we need to do some hacking. So we need to think out of the box, right, and break that limit. So let's start showing you some code. Um, first, I will start with five hacks about user interface, five or six about user interface. Um, the first one is full screen, right? So this is something that I, I, usually I get a lot of questions about this. So how can I get the full screen experience? So that's, for example, if you have a game, sometimes you want the browser UI, right, to get out of there, at least for a while, uh, while the user is playing the game, for example. So unfortunately, there is no one solution. We need one solution per platform, unfortunately. Right? Remember, we are hacking. So let's review some solutions. Again, some of these solutions may be known for you, but I will tell you some other problems that you should have. So for example, I'm pretty sure you have heard about this, right? The, the Apple meta tag for getting a, a full screen experience with you adding the page to the home screen. So what's the deal with this? So let's say that uh, you have like uh, this experience where you are showing something when I'm just starting the Chrome. Um, when you are in full screen and you're showing a different thing like, hey, add me to the home screen when you're not in full screen. So do you know what happens when you have the viewport meta tag, right? The normal default viewport meta tag, and you have the mobile web app capable meta tag, both on iPhone 5 or iPod Touch 5th generation, I mean the, the taller iPhone devices. So look at this example. This is what is happening right now. So your app in full screen is getting this letterbox status, right? You have this ugly uh, black, uh, bars at the top and at the bottom. So this is a big bug, right? So it's a re really big bug. So how to solve the problem today at least? Well, there, is two, there are two solutions. The first one, I'm not saying it's nice, right? But if you declare a viewport with a width different than device width and different than 320, like 320.1, it works. Don't ask me why, right? Because I don't know. But it works. The other solution, if you don't want to do this, is to define two viewports. 
and use a media query inside the meta that is working on iPhone. Uh, so you have a different viewport only for these kind of devices. But if not, you are not getting a full, experience, a full screen experience on iPhone 5 today using this method. Uh, so when you have this method now, you don't have the letterbox problem there, or, or bag. Let, let's talk about bags. Um, solution number two on iOS, uh, since the latest version, when you're on landscape, you have this full screen icon at the bottom right there. So uh, I have seen some games uh, doing this right now using media queries. So basically, when you access the game it, uh, in your import rate using media queries, the, the website is inviting you to go landscape first. And then it's inviting you to press the full screen button. So it's not so nice, but you can use a media query. And this is a media query if you're using the default viewport without any JavaScript uh, that is fixing viewport things. Uh, but so, but that's the idea. So you can just start the game only if the user is in full screen, and let's maybe pause the game if the user is changing the orientation or getting out of the full screen. Solution number three, and this solution is for Firefox, BlackBerry 10, and Amazon Silk. That's the um, browser on the Kindle Fire. And maybe future platform, because this is the, uh, let's say, the official way of doing full screen. It's a full screen API. Unfortunately, the full screen API today is prefixed. I mean, in, in, these, in these browsers, uh, I have just told you. So we need to provide the WebKit version and the Moth version. I mean, for Firefox, the BlackBerry 10, and that kind of stuff. But you can get the full screen experience today using this technique. And the final solution for full screen, or final hack for full screen, is for Android browser. So you all know that Android browser is not Google Chrome, right? It's a very different browser. Um, so for Android browser, we can use a, an old hack um, that is basically uh, window.scroll2 that basically will hide the URL bar and because Android doesn't have a bottom, and the Android browser doesn't have a bottom toolbar, so you are in full screen. And with care, right, if you know what you're doing, you can use, uh, you can stop the scrolling. So it will not appear again unless you press the menu button. So this is the hack that Google Maps is using for Android browser. So when you're accessing Google Maps, you get the full screen experience, right? So that was for full screen. Let's move to a shorter one. And I'm, I'm still surprised how many website developers and designers are not aware of this problem, feature, on Windows 8 and IE 10, right? So on Windows 8, you can have two Windows 8 apps at the same time on the screen. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. I mean, this is for tablets, such as Microsoft Surface, or for desktop. So if you have a desktop with Windows 8, uh, then you have this ability. So basically, when you, are, have, when you have Explorer, as, as you can see there, mm -hmm. IE 10 at the left, it's in the snap mode. That's the name when it's the, the shorter app that you have on the screen. It's applying a different technique. It, in fact, it's applying a mobile phone technique. It's applying the default viewport idea. So as you can see there, that website is basically like the website on an iPhone or an Android device by default. So basically, um, IE10 is giving you a viewport or 1024 pixels by default. So if you are doing, even if you are doing the responsive design, it will not work, right? Because uh, in this case, the, the window width is 1024 pixels. Right? So to solve the problem, uh, you need to use media queries right, and apply a viewport extension that is being discussed in the W3C as a standard. So right now, IE10 supports it as, um, with a prefix. So if you basically do this, um, you are changing the viewport only when you are in a small window. And this is exactly the snapped mode in IE10. So if you add this, you will get a, a mobile viewport, and then you can use responsive web design to adapt the UI in IE10 snapped mode. OK, high resolution canvas. 
So you all know, or you should all know, what Canvas is uh, to the drawing API uh, in JavaScript. So let's say we have a game right uh, inside the Canvas, or just a, a, a drawing, 300 pixels wide. So what's the problem? When we are saying 300 pixels, we are saying 300 CSS pixels. And you should know at this point that 300 CSS pixel may maybe you, you will have different real device pixels uh, dimensions. So there are just a couple of examples like uh, one Galaxy S1, uh, Nexus 7, uh, Galaxy S2, um, iPhone 5, or any other Android, BlackBerry 10, 224, and um, Galaxy S4. So on Galaxy S4, the canvas, in, instead of being 300 pixels, will be 900 device pixels, right? So what's the problem? The problem is that canvas is a bitmap. So from a browser's perspective, it's like a JPEG. So we are not having a high-resolution canvas by default when you are creating a game or something with canvas. It's like a JPEG, right? It's a bitmap. It's not like SVG. Uh, so on iPhone, on iPhone 5, for example, you are getting uh, a low-resolution canvas. So to solve the problem, right, with JavaScript, we can query about the device pixel radio. And there is on WebKit, on latest version of WebKit, there is a new property that you can also query about, the second one, that is called the WebKit, well, the backing store pixel radio. That is basically another pixel radio that the canvas is using. So, for example, on the iPhone 5, um, we have a device pixel radio of 2, but a canvas pixel radio of 1. That means that the canvas is low resolution. So, um, that, that's also on Chrome. So, if you have a high resolution Android and you're using Google Chrome, you are getting the same result. Uh, on other browsers, such as Firefox or Android browser, on a high uh, resolution uh, screen, the, right now, this canvas pixel radio is not available, so it's undefined. Uh, but you still get the crappy version, right? The low-resolution canvas. So we need a way, we need some hack, right? If we want to provide a high-resolution game, for example. Um, solution number one, I'm not saying it's the best one, but solution number one is changing the viewport. Instead of using the default viewport, you can use any other value, for example, 640, and then define a canvas of 640. The problem here is that if you are sharing the canvas with other content on the screen, then everything is smaller than the default size. So, I mean, it's not a good idea unless it's a full screen canvas. You need to change font size, and that's not a good idea. Um, the second solution is first, let's go step by step, three steps. First step is the canvas has a scale. We can scale the canvas. So basically, it's, it's something inside the canvas API. So when we are drawing 300 pixels, every pixel will be, will be for example, double if you are using a scale to, to 2x, 2y. But as you can see, we are not seeing the results that we want. Right? The, 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 the drawing is out of our box. So we can change the canvas width and height. But now, the drawing is out of the viewport. Right? It's out of the visible window. So to finish the hack, we need to add CSS and define the width and the height dimensions in CSS with the original dimension. I'm not saying this is nice, right? Again, this is a hack, but it works. Right? You can try it. Um, I have some examples online. Um, where you can try it on your phone and you're going to see the difference, right? When you have a low resolution canvas or a high resolution canvas. So, some warnings. Try to make this multi platform because not every platform is supporting this back in pixel ra radio value for the canvas. And do this multi resolution, not always two. Maybe it's 1.5, so it's not always two. It's not only like uh, Apple wanted, right? One or two. So, just uh, these disclaimers. And when you are doing a high resolution canvas, be aware that you are consuming more power because the drawing is more complex and you are using more memory. Right? So you need to uh, take care of that. Uh, the next one, that's 
really quick. Truly numeric field. What is this? So um, I'm pretty sure you all know about this, right? Input type number. And on, let's say, Windows Phone, BlackBerry 10, or Android, we are getting a nice numeric keyboard. But on iOS, we are getting a numeric keyboard, right? But I can switch to alphanumeric. So uh, of course, there is, there is another solution that is using the tell, like as a telephone. But that doesn't seem so good, right? Using input type tell because I just want a pin for a bank account, for example. So the hack here is to use the same number, but with pattern, with a regular expression. And iOS will show you the nice numeric only keyboard. And the good news here is that we can use this also with password. So I can have, for example, for a bank account, a, for a PIN, enter your PIN, I can use password with the pattern, and I will get a numeric keypad on iOS. Right? And this is a standard, so this is a nice hack, because uh, I'm not doing anything strange here. This will work on every phone, and that's OK. It's a valid, do it's valid document. Nothing strange here. So this one is also really quick. So rich editor, right? How to make a rich editor on, on, on mobile devices for HTML5. You, ma you may know about content editable, right? How many of you are aware of content editable? OK, a lot, like 30%. Um, we need to thank to Microsoft to content editable, right? That's a Microsoft invention, like Ajax and iFrame, maybe, um, and, and Blink. Um, so with content editable, we can create, for example, this UL on, on Android, on BlackBerry 10, and other browsers, and even on IE. Uh, you will get, when you click on the UL, right? a non-interactive element by default, when you click on the UL, you get the keyboard, and the user can type. And if the user is uh, pressing the return key or enter, it's creating new allies directly on the DOM. But the important part I want to show you is, is what, what is happening on iOS. Let me show you. On iOS, it, it's working. I mean, I can add more items. But look what's happening when I make a selection. So I make a selection. I have a nice menu right, where I can use ball, italics, and underline. Right? So that looks better on the iPad. Right? But um, basically, for free, without adding any code, you are getting that submenu uh, on iOS devices, on Safari for iOS. Unfortunately, there is no API for this to add more items on the menu, at least for now. Um, OK, this, I believe this is the last one on the UI. I call this the background tab resurrection. I should call it something. I can call them like uh, zombie tabs, too. So for this um, hack, I have a video, but let me jump to the simulator so we can make a live demo. So I have this is the iPad simulator, right? So I will add a new tab. And I have here a bookmark. So this tab is basically changing the title every one second. Right? Nothing fancy, just set interval, changing the, the title. So I want to show you this. What happens when I'm ch switching tabs? If I go to another tab, look at the, the tab at, uh, at the right. Basically, now it's frozen. So Safari on iOS, iPad, and iPhone uh, freezes every background tab. So can we resurrect? that tab somehow? Well, I found a solution for that. Um, so let me show you first the code, the, not the code, the, the working example. So uh, let me jump to the resurrected tab. So um, no, let me add it in a new tab. Let's go again, resurrected tab. OK, so now it's the same example, right? So you can see here it's working because it's the active tab. But now I will switch tabs, right? And look at the title. It's a starting again. Right? I'm resurrecting, right? Now it's a zombie tab. Um, so, and this is working on iPhone too. The problem is that on iPhone, there is no, I mean, Safari on iPhone that doesn't have any UI like tabs. So changing the title has um, no, I mean, doesn't, doesn't work. But 
In this case, I mean, this example, it's a simple example to show how to do that, but we can use this, for example, to uh, update every minute. I mean, if, if you are Gmail or Facebook, you can update the title if there is something new, like emulating desktop behavior. But uh, on iPad, we have this uh, freezing problem. So, how to do this? Let's see. Again, do you remember our friend Blink? So it's not with Blink, but I'm just uh, trying to get your memory. So if you remember Blink, right, you should remember BG Sound, right? Excellent element. I'm not sure why it's not in HTML5. Um, <coughs> font family, right, or font with family and size, right? That's nice. And I can continue, like, using block quotes, uh, nested block quotes, just for adding margins and paddings. So that's from the 90s, right? So from the same period, we have the refresh metadata, right? So do you know about the refresh metadata? How many of you are aware of the refresh metadata? OK, great. That's the metadata that when you are on a newspaper website looking at or seeing a video, right? In the middle of the video, the whole page refreshes. So uh, why we can use this all hack on the frozen tab? So somehow, Safari on iOS honors the refresh metadata on a frozen tab. So for example, if I'm using this, every two seconds, the tab will be refreshed automatically. Right? So when we are going, when we are leaving that tab on the background, after two seconds, it's going to be updated by default. And fortunately for us, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's being reloaded, that tab keeps alive. Right? So what's the problem of using this hack? Is that when the, the tab is active, it's also being reloaded every two seconds. Right? So to solve that problem, that little JavaScript will solve the problem. Basically, if we just, with JavaScript, we redefine the content right, of the original meta tag, if we really declare this with the same value, it doesn't matter. It's shifting the reload operation. So I'm shifting every one second the reload operation. So if the uh, tab is active, I'm shifting the reload operation. If not, it will reload after two seconds. And that's how I can resurrect the tab. Right? So I'm, I know what you're thinking, right? Things like this, right? Uh, so I, I will not be responsible of this, so uh, because on iPhone, we can use alert, right? I mean, I don't have the document.title available because I'm not seeing it, but I can make alert. In this case, you have an empty tab, but I have a background resurrected window, and it's making me an alert. So a disclaimer, I'm not responsible for all the crappy websites that are going to use this for sending you alerts every two seconds. Um, so this works only on iOS 6.1. On, on 5 and 6.0, uh, it works, but slightly different. So we can make it work. Basically, uh, it will reload the page, but it will maintain the tab alive only uh, until the unload event. So after the unload event, it will be frozen again. But if, if we have like a meta refresh every one minute, it will be honor the meta refresh without problems. Right? So, um, it, it, it works in a slightly different, but from iOS 5, we can do this. OK, I know I have uh, the last one for UI. So um, this, this might not be new for you, right? Like how to make images for different screen densities, right? So we come back to a simple example, just an image, right? We know when we are saying 300 there, it, it's 300. Uh, CSS pixels. And as we saw before, we will have problems with the pixel ratio. And the, pro the, the problem also happens when we are zooming in a page, right? Sometimes we get a crappy version of the image. And we need to try to solve that somehow. Um, so again, just uh, to remember what's happening here, right? When we have different screen densities. So I will show you all the possible solutions or hacks that are working today, right? Unfortunately, there is no solution from the HTML side. 
as you might know. Uh, solution number one, using vector images. I'm pretty sure that you should know this. Like using SVG as just a, an external resource, using SVG as just an HTML5 element, right, inside. Um, you can use SVG on CSS, on some browsers too, like a, a background image. Um, and using also font face for icons, like uh, that kind of stuff. So just a quick example, this is the uh, LA Times website. Um, and when you just try to zoom in into the logo, that's the image that you are seeing. And if you look at the New York Times website, right, you are getting a nice high resolution logo because it's SVG. So uh, if you are a developer and not a designer, you need to call your designer and get all the original files, illustrator files for everything, so you can get the SVGs. Um, solution number two uh, is using JavaScript. So there were some discussion around this before, so I will not get into details, but basically we can use JavaScript to load a different image or change the image if the device is high resolution. Solution number three, only for iOS until now, uh, is to use an extension that iOS has since version six. It's a prefixed function. It's called image set. Basically, with image set, you can provide two, it can be more, but for now, it's only two images, two URLs with the, well, it doesn't, they can be data URLs too, um, so inline images. Uh, defining the UX, and 2x, the 1x and, and, and 2x. The problem with this solution is that it works only for uh, specific values. Um, there are some devices, like uh, some Android tablets or even the BlackBerry 10, that the number is 2, 24, 7, blah, 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 blah. Right? So I need a solution where I can use ranges, not specific values. Right? So, and the final solution and the solution that you might know, already know, is not using semantic images, but using, so images in HTML, but um, using CSS background images. So um, using a, a, an extension to the media queries, I mean, a, a, a non-standard property that we can query on the media queries, um, like the device pixel radio, we can change the background image, change, defining also the background size. I will not take too much time explaining why the background size, but if you try, you will need the background size. Unfortunately, what's the problem here? Well, that because it's non-standard, we need different um, declarations, right? So in media queries, there are no or operator. So you have, we have the and operator, but not the or, but we can use the comma, right, as a multiple selector. So uh, for example, we can add the Mozilla version. That, that's not a typo, as you can see here. Um, when we are using the mean prefix, right, for ranges, so uh, on WebKit, it's dash WebKit dash mean. On Firefox, it's mean dash dash moth. Um, then we still have a lot of Opera out there, right, with the Presto engine. Uh, so there you need the O uh, prefix, and it's not using the um, a value, but the fraction there, so we need to use a fraction. And finally, the future-proof solution uh, on the W3C, the standard solution will be to use the resolution, already standard property, but with a new unit called DPPX that has nothing to do with PPK, right? DPPX, uh, it's device, um, device pixels per pixels, right? Device pixel per CSS pixel. So it's a pixel radio, basically. Um, so warnings. Always query on ranges. So I'm seeing plenty of devices, mostly because of Apple, right? Um, that they're doing this. They're just saying WebKit device picks a radio too. So on the BlackBerry 10, on the Galaxy S4, and probably on a future iPhone ultra super high resolution, uh, you will deliver or you will expose the low resolution image because we are just asking for two, not greater than two. So always use mean, right? And if you're using mean, you don't need to use two. You can use 1.7 or 1.8 or whatever. Um, and always, this, I'm, I'm not the only one saying this today, find the balance, right? But because on the S4, one image, if you want to use the ultra super high resolution, right, it's 
three per three times bigger. So nine times bigger. So you need to find the, the balance on your images and size and memory usage and uh, uh, um, HTTP network requests. So now I will jump to some other hacks about uh, device interaction. So media capture. I mean, this is not new, but I'm looking a lot of. I'm seeing a lot of people that are not uh, aware that we can use that today. So for media capture, like taking a picture, for example, um, you know that there are some APIs to take the camera that are not yet available on, on on the main platforms. I mean, you can use that on BlackBerry 10. You can use that on Opera for Android uh, and Chrome, but it's available under the flag that you need to activate today. So. But there are something simpler, right, that we can use today. Coming back to our uh, old friend, right, the input type file, um, we can add some um, properties there. For example, the accept property. So if, you, if we use the accept property, like for example, image, video, or audio, for example, on iOS, at least image and video only, you will be able to take a picture from the camera, right? I will show you a demo right now about that. And there is a, a W3C specification. It's an extension to the input type file that is called the HTML media capture. Uh, unfortunately, there is an old spec and a new spec. So, and of course, all the browsers out there are using the old spec right now. So the old spec means that the capture should have a value like camera, camcorder, or microphone. Uh, the new spec is, means that the capture is just a Boolean attribute. Because if it's an image, I don't need to say capture from the camera, right? It's obvious. So um, let me jump to my camera here. So I can show you this live. So I have a BlackBerry 10 here. So I can show you this on Android, of course, but uh, let's change it. So I have a BlackBerry 10, right? So I have an HTML. This is the browser. I have an HTML. Here you can see that here it says uh, take a picture, right? And we have an image file. This is working again on Firefox on Android. It's working on, on Chrome on Android. It's working on Android browser on Android. So I will pick an image, and it's opening the camera app, right? So I can take a picture of you. Please smile, right? So and I took the picture. Come on, orientation. And you can see that I'm not just taking the picture as a source, but I can use uh, the file API and JavaScript to read the contents of the, of the file. In this case, I'm just uh, adding it to the page. But I can even try to detect your faces and who is bored and who's not, right? Who is just checking emails. Um, and it's working. And now let me jump to the iPad. So I'm not so kamikaze because I can share the screen on the Wi-Fi, but that's too risky. So let's use the camera instead. Just, just the camera a little bit. So I got the same HTML on my iPad, right? So you can see I have select an image file here. So I will click choose a file, right? And it, it, it's asking me, do you want to take a, a picture, a photo right now, or choose one from the gallery? I will say take photo, and now I have the camera up again. I'm sorry, you need to smile again. OK, here we are. So um, I will say, do you, do you like this? Let me change the orientation. OK. Do you like this picture? I say, yes. Use it. And now I have the same experience here on the iPad. Right? And even uh, iOS, instead of showing me a temporary name, it's showing me a nice, really nice uh, a little thumbnail of my picture there. Right? So I mean, you can use this today. It's working. Uh, on mostly all the platforms. Just to give you uh, some clear information about this, uh, the capture attribute uh, is being ignored by iOS. So iOS is using the accept attribute. And all the other browsers are using basically both. Um, OK, so I, I read it. Interacting with native apps. I will, uh, the first part, I will skip it quickly because we are, the, the other speaker already t told you about this, but basically, what about this, right? When you access a website and you get the nice, nice, 
a banner saying, hey, get my app, download my app. Even there is a website, right, called I Don't Want Your Beautiful App, um, where you can see a lot of websites that are doing that kind of stuff. So solutions for these marketing guys that wants to do that kind of stuff. So first, don't do that, right? That's the first part of the solution. Solution number two is that there are two platforms that already offers a way, a, a, let's say, better way to do this kind of web uh, native integration. So on iOS, we can use this meta tag. Right? With this meta tag, uh, we will get this smart app banner. Right? Um, the smart banner will have a view uh, button if the app is already installed, or an install button going to the app store if the app is not there. And you can add arguments. So you can send arguments from the website to the app. So instead of just opening the home page on the app, you can maintain the same resources that you are uh, seeing or, something, or, or, or send session information or wherever. On Windows 8, you can do the same thing. Uh, so you can, add this, uh, you can use this MS application um, meta tag from, from Microsoft, and it's basically the same thing. And the UI is uh, different. So basically, when, on, on the URL bar on IE10, we are going to see that when there is an, uh, like, um, an app for this website, right? you can see that in this case, I can get the app. There is a menu for that. And if the app is already installed, in this case, it's Cut the Rope. You can access the Cut the Rope website right yourself if you have I10. Um, so you can switch to the app. Right? And you can also send arguments from the website to the, to the, um, the, the app. By the way, you may say, hey, Microsoft has just copied Apple. In fact, it was um, Microsoft was the first one showing this uh, solution. Uh, unfortunately, there is no API for this. So with JavaScript, I cannot check if the app is there or not. It's just the browser is managing everything. And there is no Android solution yet. The, the last part of the solution is, OK, I want to open the native app from my own code. right? So usually, you do that calling a custom protocol. For example, Twitter. If you add this link on iOS and Android, and the user has the Twitter app, it will open the Twitter app and with that message. right? Um, the problem is what happens when the Twitter app is not there. So the user doesn't have the Twitter app. So on iOS, you get this ugly dialogue. right? So how to try to hack this? So the way is that if you, instead of going with a link, you go with JavaScript to that custom URL like Twitter, and after a while, you move to a second page, right? the dialogue will be dismissed automatically. And on the second page, you can say, hey, you don't have the app. Why don't you install the app? Of course, what happens if the user goes to Twitter and then goes back to Safari? So it, it will go to the second page, too. So you can, have a time, you can, have a, you can use local storage and, and check how, how much time has passed between one and the other and do something around that. On Android, right? It's different on Chrome, for example, because instead of showing you a dialogue, it's showing you a, an error page. Right? So to do the same thing on, on Google Chrome, right, you need to use an iframe. So the user will never see an, an invisible iframe. The user will never see the, the error there. Right? And it's the same thing. OK, push notification. So I, I, I mean, I, I, um, I don't have a magic solution here. So how, from a website, can we send push notifications to a user? So this is something that uh, I've seen that web developers are still not getting. That's why I'm adding this here. On iOS, there is something called the Passbook. Right? The Passbook is an app on iOS 6. And the good thing is that you can create a Passbook. The user doesn't need to install your app. So just from your website, you can deliver a Passbook. And the great thing about passbooks, um, the passbook will look like this on the user's passbook app. Uh, so you can create some kind of a membership to your website, create a passbook for that. And with passbook, you can send push messages. Without a native app from your server, you can push messages to that iOS user. Even you can 
uh, ena enable your enable a, a notification when the user is nearby some location. And the notification or what you are pushing can include links back to your website or information. So it can include HTML. Right? And, and it's a push message that you can use. Unfortunately, you need to pay $99 per year. So you need to be an Apple iOS developer to sign the, um, the passbook and to send the, the push messages. But the user doesn't need to install your app. It can install the, pass the passbook from your website. Um, so enhancing your app. iOS home screen title. So on iOS, you know that we can click uh, on the share button and add to the home screen, right? But look here, when I am to the home screen, I have a problem. The title now is WTF Mobile Wii, right? Because iOS is just taking the first 13 letters of your title. And of course, we are using long titles because we want that for SEO, right? We want that for marketing on Google. We want long titles. So making a short title is not really a good solution. So I have found an undocumented feature, a meta tag, that is working on iOS. It's called Mobile Web App Title. If you define the Mobile Web App Title, iOS will take that value and not the title element when you're adding this to the home screen. Uh, and it works. You can try it. Live Tile for i10. So on i10, again, Windows 8, you have the pin feature, right? You can pin websites to the start screen. Um, with some meta tags, you can define the image and the background color, right? So that that's might be new for you, but it's not new, right? So, but I've said live title, right? I want to like push something to that tile. Um, so, I mean, that's not new, but it's unknown usually for web developers that you can define another meta tag that is called the badge. The badge takes a frequency and a URI, a URL, right? So I can say, for example, every hour, every 10 minutes, every day, it's up to you, go to this URL, and the operating system will go to that URL for you. I mean, you don't, the user doesn't need to have the, the, your website opened, right? And get the URL. That URL contains just an XML, a simple XML. For example, it can say three. So it will add that free uh, thing, the thing there, like you have three and read messages or whatever, or three new, new news or what you want. And there are also a list of icons that you can use, like a star or a caution or something like that. For example, you have new messages. So you can somehow like uh, update the tile on the start screen on i10 for Windows 8 users. Um, storage limits. So app cache, local storage, web SQL, IndexedDB, and other file system APIs, uh, they all have some limits. I will not get into the details of the limits because it depends on the version. The, there is a mess there. But um, I want to show you that using different domains, iframes, and the cross-document messaging API, you can basically uh, get out, break those limits. And I, I'm not sure if you have checked this website. It's called fillthis.com, right? It will basically, in this case, the iPad, it will fill my iPad with cuts, right? <laughs> uh, and of course, there is a button there so I can stop the madness and I can get back my space, right? But you can try it, right? Um, and it, you can check the website. You have all the implementation and how to do that. And you can basically break the limit. So be careful, because browsers are trying to add some kind of uh, security um, measure for this kind of stuff. So it might not work in the future. And do you really need more space? So think about that, right? Um, maybe you can use some kind of compression or, or some, some other solution. And finally, I have some tools I want to show you just really quickly, because I, I'm, I'm surprisingly, I usually get a lot of web designers and web developers that are not aware of these tools. And I'm, I'm not talking about simulators or emulators that you might know. For example, first, bandwidth simulators. You can simulate 3G or 2G connections on your desktop. 
I mean, it's not the real experience, but at least you can see what's happening in terms of performance with your website, with a real device or with a simulator. So for example, on Windows, there is a net limiter. Of course, my presentation will be online later, so you will have all the URLs. Um, on Mac, there is a Slowy app that is pretty cool. You have a menu there, and you can select uh, the, the bandwidth you want to emulate. And Charles Proxy that you uh, may, may know because it's a well-known application for its proxy. Uh, it has a, a way to throttle the connection, too, so you can emulate 3G or 2G. Virtual mobile apps. So if you don't have a device and you don't have an emulator, you don't want emulators on your computer, uh, I want to show you just, just some free solutions that are out there. Right? So you can use it for free. There are commercial solutions, too. So for example, Nokia on developer.nokia.com has a service called, um, called a remote, uh, remote Device Access that you can use for free, like 40, I don't remember the number, but 40 or 50 devices, uh, real devices, right? Not emulators. So our devices on the cloud, and you're using them remotely. Um, even there is a phone number. You can call, and you can see the incoming call in Finland. Um, Samsung already has a similar solution. It's called Remote Test Lab. There are some, uh, some tablets, some Android phones, and some Bada phones that you can use remotely for free. And uh, the guys from uh, Device Anywhere now has a free solution for web developers. So for free, again, you can use 10 devices between iPhones, Androids, and Windows Phone for free just for 10 minutes. Right? But for 10 minutes, you can use, we can take screenshots. You can see on a real device how your website, your website is doing. Right? Um, it's free again, so you, you should use this kind of tools. Then if you need more time or more devices, like 300, you can buy a, a, an account on pay per hour. Um, what are the most used key combinations for a web developer? Um, I can think of Tom, right? Uh, but I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about this combination, right? Alt-Tab, Refresh. Alt-Tab, Refresh for testing. Right? So on mobile browsers, that's not so easy, right? Because I need to make a change and then go to the device, look where the reload is. And if you have 45 devices like me, you need to remember where is the reload button on that browser, right? And refresh to see if now your website is doing um, well. So there is a, a, a bunch of tools that are appearing right now for live reloading. So the one I, I tried, and it's, it works really, really great, it's open source, but uh, you can buy it, for example, from, from Mac. It's live reload, livereload.com. Basically, it's um, monitoring your local file system. And every time it sees a change on your CSS, on an image, or even on HTML, it will reload it on your phone. It, it works for desktop, too. It works for phones. It's using sockets or other technology to make the connection while you are developing. Of course, you need to remove the script after you are done. But basically, that's easy. Then you change the image, and you see live the change on your phone. Right? You don't need to save, reload, or do anything like that. So these are, for me, um, important tools you need to use. So wrapping up, browsers are different. So that's why we need hacks. right? We don't live in an ideal situation on the mobile uh, world, mobile web world right now. Usually, there are no enough information. The documentation is outdated, or there is no documentation on how to do uh, one stuff or the other. Um, a lot of undocumented features that the community is finding, just testing, right? And a lot of bugs. So the mobile web is a buggy web, right, by, by definition. Unfortunately, right? I'm not just saying that that's the, the way to go. Um, however, usability and performance usually matters a lot, right? So I'm not saying, hey, develop by hacks only, right? These hacks are just for a specific situation, and this, this com this, my, my talk here today is about breaking limits, so we are using hacks. But be careful always using hacks, right? Um, your app should work, must work anyway if the hack is not there or if a new version is removing the, the, our possibilities or something like that. And always use feature detection, right? Um, so we have COBOR 15 hacks, right? How many of you 
have learned at least three today. OK, so I'm done for, for the day. So you just made my day. So if you, have, if you can go home with three new hacks, I'm OK. And finally, do you know this guy? No? This is Heraclitus. I believe he was uh, like 2,500 years ago. He was a good mobile uh, web developer because he has said that change is the only constant. And that's basically the definition of the mobile web environment, right? So thank you. Thanks for the, uh, the kind of the mad scientist tour of the mobile web okay. the there, um, in a good way. Um, so first off, a lot, of that, the, a lot of that presentation probably needs like a big fat Spider-Man disclaimer on it, right? The, with the great power comes great responsibility. The, the, the refreshing, the mm -hmm. resurrecting the tab, I imagine as, which is awesome. Uh, but I imagine like there's performance implications, right, of keeping well, it running yeah, the entire time. It's big a deal, mobile right? I mean, trying to get that... Uh, Reloading the whole page every one second is not a good idea, right? No. So that's one example, but the idea is that you can use that. So every two minutes, you can just make an Ajax request and see if there is something new and, and try to attract users' attention on that to give a service to the user, that kind of stuff. So, but usually, yeah, technology comes yeah, with responsibility, right? There's definitely, right? There's definitely things to, to use it for, but like in, intensive computations or like frequent requests like that. It would probably not a great idea, right? No, no, yeah. of course. Um, for, the, for, the, for the pixel ratio stuff, you, you showed using the um, min device pixel ratio with all the prefixes and then min resolution with the, the new DPPX. DPPX. Can you just, you can just do, couldn't you do just WebKit min device pixel ratio and then also use the min resolution, um, the DPI? Aren't those, isn't that fairly supported yeah. as well? Yeah, well, the thing is that uh, Firefox has said that it will take the WebKit too, but today at least there are still some Firefox not supporting the WebKit prefix, at least on the mobile uh, environment. So uh, that's why maybe for a little while we still yeah. need the, the most version. Yeah, it would be great to avoid browsers supporting the WebKit prefix unless they're WebKit browsers in my opinion. But fortunately, but I get we, are, it. I get fortunately it. we uh, prefixes has... Uh, uh, is out for the future. So yes, that's good news. Um, and then what, somebody asked, and I think it's a legitimate question: How on earth did you find the content refresh thing? Like, what goes? Th what's? Your, let us into <laughs> the mind of Max. How the heck do you get to that? Uh, I'm a frog, you said. So I don't know. <laughs> no, no, you dissect <laughs> like a frog. Okay. I want to clarify. So in that particular case, was a specific use case. So I, I, uh, I had a customer trying to do that. So I'm starting to say, okay, let's see why can we try to trick this, even on the, uh, when I was writing the book. So there is a section about uh, JavaScript execution. So I was uh, talking about, well, your JavaScript is not going to be there always, so you, you can be frozen for times. So I'm starting to dig into what you can do. So it's, that's right. how I get it. That's fantastic. Thanks. Okay, thank you.